Hello everyone, um, I'm Dr. Jennifer Lewis and I'm happy to be a part of the survivorship meeting today and to present this talk to you on communicating, communicating a cancer diagnosis to family, friends and employers. I do not have any financial interests to disclose. So by way of an agenda, I thought it would be helpful to discuss present more of an overview of what I intend to talk about today with you. Um, the overview really is um, just setting the context for the, having this discussion about communicating a cancer diagnosis to other people and some of the trials and tribulations that people tend to encounter when they're trying to do this. Um, so I thought I would discuss a little bit about that, some of the theoretical constructs that might be helpful to kind of ground this conversation, as well as strategies on how to disclose practical applications that might be helpful for you. And also a component of the talk today is to discuss work related disclosure strategies as well. Okay. So. I think it's pertinent when we think about cancer to just to give a little bit of data around the prevalence of cancer in the United States. So approximately 1.9 million people are diagnosed with cancer each year, and that's affecting approximately 5.5% of the US population. Unfortunately, um, there's a significant amount of transition um, with cancer, um, and one in three people will have cancer in their lifetime. So there's usually about approximately $185 billion is spent on each year on cancer care and research, even though cancer is the second leaders, leading um, disease in the United States, followed by heart disease and stroke. There's you know, a significant amount of data and research uh, being done still, obviously. So a cancer diagnosis, as we know, is generally is generally is motion is emotionally difficult for the majority of individuals to deal with we know that that's a fact that's a given i'm sure the majority of people on this call also attest to that um what comes with it however is the emotions of trying to deal with having a diagnosis such as cancer themselves so some of the symptoms might be anxiety some of some fear uncertainty distress worry helplessness amongst other things and it takes an emotional toll in you know, dealing with that and then also having to now disclose that cancer diagnosis to other people, because it sometimes opens the door for many people would describe as scrutiny, vulnerability, and even rejection, unfortunately. And deciphering medical terminology, understanding new treatment regimens often requires social support. Such support, uh, for social support, um, as individuals will sometimes need to consider thinking about disclosing their cancer diagnosis to others just to gain that support from other people. So how can we understand this a little better? So what does the research say? There is evidence around disclosing um, hereditary illnesses. So we see that's well documented, certainly research around breast cancer, like how a person might disclose that, especially if it's, it's an hereditary diagnosis or an illness, um, that's well documented. Even HIV research literature, there's a lot of uh, information there on different ways to disclose as well, different models that we will take a look at. So that, that lends itself very well to the cancer um, diagnosis and or the cancer disclosure. Um, and what we've learned from looking at the HIV research is that you know, there are fears of stigma, discrimination when we disclose, and a perceived burden on other people. So those are the things that we want to think about when we're considering disclosing as well. But in terms of how the how it's done or who delivers the message, let's say, the, the physicians, there's typically um, guidelines for physicians to um, disseminate that information that the person has a cancer diagnosis. So that's well documented too. And there are ethical, ethical obligations to disclose a cancer diagnosis to individuals. So we know what to do with that. Well, the physicians definitely know how to disclose. What we also know, however, is that um, 
sometimes some, it's also important to look at some of the studies and what we also know that with breast cancer, for instance, um, typically some of the research has indicated that um, non-disclosure is associated with less social support. So um, basically we know that if, you, if a person chooses not to disclose um, their diagnosis of any kind, certainly in this study, it found that it does lead to decreased feelings of you know, emotional well-being. People don't feel as good. They don't feel as protected. They don't feel um, supported. Um, so that's one um, theoretical construct. Another one is um, there are mixed reviews on um, there are positive effects of disclosing to family members. And that's the jury's out on that because it depends on your construction of your family. It could be a biological family component. It could be um, a family that uh, you have created for yourself and you define that as a family, but it doesn't always go as smoothly as we would like. So sometimes there are some sort of mixed views, mixed feelings about whether they use the family, but majority of the case, we find that family, good family support is also helpful in helping a person disclose. So we'll get into that in a little bit more detail later. But the general consensus is that disclosure is linked to social support, just as I mentioned, and uh, physical and social well-being. So there is a dearth of information around that. So we kind of leaning towards that. Um, but the one thing we have noticed that's lacking in the literature is that there's um, a paucity on disclosing non-hereditary cancer diagnosis to others. So that's where we're talking about family, friends, um, colleagues, you know, co-workers, um, work uh, directors, and so on. So that's where we're sort of stuck in the mud a little bit. Sorry, it's okay. Um, so how do we broach this subject of disclosure per se? What does it mean to disclose a cancer diagnosis? So I think it's important to operationalize this. Um, and some of the literature has indicated a really good, easy snapshot of how disclosure in relation to cancer is operationalized. And um, this quote is, the extent to which cancer patients openly discuss with others their diagnosis and thoughts and feelings about their disease. I mean, it's simplistic enough and many people will agree and understand what that literally means. But I just want you to hold that in your minds for just a little bit in terms of openly discuss with their diagnosis and thoughts and feelings with, about their disease. So I think that's something we need to kind of keep in our mind as we're going through this. And something to remind um, folks of today is that disclosure is also a dynamic and gradual process. It's not a one and done and it's done. Um, sometimes people think it's an event and it's a one-time thing, but it's evolving. It's constantly evolving because it, uh, people are in different contexts and different um, experiences and they have different uh, times that they might want to disclose it to different people. So it's always a constant sort of dynamic process that you want to be mindful of. So what goes along with that, however, are some negative emotions. Um, sometimes there's sadness for the emotional pain the person feels that they are inflicting on their loved ones when they're having these conversations about disclosure. And sometimes there's a fear of burdening family members or family and friends you know, with their illness. I hear that um, many times when I'm um, with my clients as well. Sometimes people can feel guilt after disclosing. So these are just a few, a snapshot of some of the things that people might struggle with um, when they're trying to decide whether or not to disclose. So the, but however, so one begs the question then, what are the advantages of disclosing? And there are certainly advantages. Um, it does for one strengthen our social support networks when we disclose because we're sort of in more of a camaraderie sort of supportive relationship with other people. We're in a trusting relationship um, and, and we're vulnerable, but we're open, opening ourselves up to sort of, um, you know, gaining support by actually um, sharing with our social support network. Network. So it's really important to think about it from that perspective. And again, shared feelings and thoughts may create less of an emotional burden on the person who's disclosing or the discloser. And what we also know that there are enhanced, it enhances our psychological well-being 
we feel relief, we feel a sense of validation when we disclose. And if you were to consider disclosing in your workplace, then that also provides an area where we can gain support from our coworkers, our colleagues, and we can manage those workplace expectations. Um, and similarly, we can also plan time away uh, from work if we need to attend to medical appointments and maintain job security. So that's what, those are some of the reasons why we might want to consider um, a job sorry, um, disclosing at work. Next slide. Okay, so I think the other thing that we might want to think about, and this is about um, how do we disseminate the information? How do we kind of conceptualize what the disclosure method is, let's say? And as I mentioned at the beginning of this talk that um, from the HIV literature as well, it's lent itself very well to um, how a disclosure model might be in effect, it might take effect. And what are some of the strategies or the thoughts that go into our mind when we're trying to assess for ourselves, whether or not we'd like to disclose um, something such as a cancer diagnosis. So the first step is really the decision to disclose. Um, and that's something, it's an individual. So that's where it says about the self, you know, how, how are we impacted by this? You know, and we have questions about, do we want to disclose? Who do we disclose to? What are, our, what are the relationships like, like in terms of your interpersonal dynamics? What are they like? Do we trust them? Um, can we trust them when we disclose such a sensitive personal information to another person? So those are some of the things that we consider when we're disclosing, we're thinking about disclosing. Another one obviously comes into this disclosing uh, disclosure methodology is we have to consider stigma, right? Um, we have to consider there might be some negative reactions to our disclosing something such as a cancer diagnosis. Um, and some of the factors that are involved are really around uh, the symptoms that might emerge. So for instance, there's a lot of data around vis visible symptoms. Like um, if, you're, if you have cancer, if you're living with cancer, then the question might pop, some, might pop into your mind about, well, how evident is my cancer dying to other people? You know, can they see it? Um, so that also determines whether or not a person is more likely to disclose or when they're likely to disclose and so on. Prognosis is another thing. Um, you know, what is your prognosis? So these are the things that you, might, you need to kind of like sift through um, in order to kind of prepare yourself and you know, have preparation here as well for the disclosure event. Um, and then you ask yourself, well, how relevant is it for me to disclose to this person versus this person? Are they indirectly involved in my life or are they directly involved in my life and I would need to disclose to them? So those are some of the considerations that um, people struggle with when they're trying to make these decisions. Um, the other thought is the second step is really the disclosure message strategy. So that in essence is talking about the skill set that a person might feel they have, um, how equipped they feel able to dis deliver that message, um, how is that message disseminated, um, various ways of people have done this via um, the, the most common is the individual face to face approach, which we know tends to be daunting sometimes, but in, e in essence, it is actually the most effective way to disclose something such as personal such as this. Um, another method, um, and that's, it depends on the individual, is really um, social media. And that's a, a tricky one because uh, there are pros and cons disclosing that way. Like people have posted things on Facebook, for instance, and only you as the individual can determine whether or not that's a viable method for you to disclose. But obviously we always, you know, are on the side of caution when something like that, when you're thinking of something like that, because it's so public. Um, and then another way to disclose is through the third party. And then when I mean third party is there are other forums such as the Caring Bridge Forum, which is a sort of, a, you know, secure, safe space where people, you know, like a digital platform where someone might actually take the reins from you, have an updated commentary about how the person's doing, what their treatments, how the treatment's going and so on. So you don't have to you know, worry yourself necessarily about constantly sort of disclosing information about your, your treatment progression. 
And then the last thing to think about is the disclosure outcome. So um, usually when a person decides to disclose, they also think about the person they're disclosing to, um, like what, how they think that person will react to what they're sharing. So they most of the time have a sense of their sensibilities with that individual and say, okay, I think that this person is more likely to be accepting of me and be supportive of me. So I'm sure I feel comfortable disclosing. So that's a, a big, big factor too. Um, moving on to the next slide. Okay. So um, just looking at the, so now that we know what goes into the mechanism of thought processes for disclosing, what are the practical ways to disclose? Like what's the sort of general thing that you can take away from this? Well, you can certainly make a plan and some people actually um, make a plan to, to, to determine how and who to disclose to. So for instance, they might make a list, write a list of who they think would be appropriate as a person to receive that sort of you know, precious information. And usually we do start with family first and however definition of family you, you might find you can obviously do that friends or vice versa there's no set way it's really entirely up to you and obviously employers or colleagues and I say obviously but it, it shouldn't really say that because you still have to determine whether or not you feel you want to disclose to other people in, including uh, work colleagues and employers but if you do tell co-workers and colleagues they do recommend that you tell more like an immediate supervisor or manager first because um and also HR, this is a good idea to do too. And I'll explain further in the conversation and I'll talk today why that might be a good idea for you to do that. And they also recommend maybe rehearsing what you intend to say too. And that would be helpful. Um, setting boundaries is, is appropriate because sometimes once you open Pandora's box and you start to share, people tend to, not intentionally, but they just are inquisitive. They ask you more sort of pointed questions and you might feel a little bit out of your depth or uncomfortable so you might want to think about how you're going to set boundaries around that sort of thing um, and then the last part is think about how much you want to share um, that's really you're in the driver's seat there so next slide okay so I, I did illustrate just a couple of quotes here I just wanted to share with you what you know some people their experience have been in sharing and one of the quotes here is quote I did tell my employer it made getting time off for treatment much easier and they were very understanding plus would have been hard to hide once I lost all my hair that's one person's account another person's account is oh I'm okay oh I'm fine even though I wasn't then I finally just told them I don't feel good and I stopped pretending because that was tearing me apart I couldn't be emo I couldn't be emotionally strong and I was trying to be physically strong and I can't do I couldn't do both. Next slide, please. So that's so it's important to keep how these experiences occurred for these particular individuals. But I also think as we transition to thinking about how to disclose to work colleagues or at work, we want to be mindful of some acts that are really important for you to know about if you don't already know. And these are the Americans with Disabilities Act. So this is a really, it's a federal law that protects you from discrimination based on your status as a cancer survivor. Um, employers cannot legally decide not to hire you because you are a cancer survivor. Um, and knowing that you are sort of, you know about the Americans with Disabilities Act or ADA, it's really important that you familiarize yourself with some of the provisions that they offer, such as reasonable accommodations. And we can go into that in a little bit more detail in the next slide. Next slide, please. All right. So um, when we look at work-related disclosure rights, you have rights. Um, disclosure is generally not required at work but may be necessary to disclose your diagnosis, your cancer diagnosis, to access these services that are available to you. Um, so according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, there are discrimination protections um, that are available to you as a cancer patient or a cancer, someone who's living with cancer. Um, they also make reasonable accommodations, which include periodic breaks or a private area for you to take medication and perhaps rest if you need to. 
Um, and this is not in every um, employment uh, setting, unfortunately. So you'd have to definitely understand your, your particular employment background or the setting and determine whether or not that's something that happens there. Um, they may grant you approval to work from home, sort of flex time, that sort of thing. And then maybe offloading some of your tasks to another employee. Um, so that also might be helpful. Um, and then medical leave. That's the other thing. So sorry about that. Um, medical leave might be the other thing. So I, I gave you a, an information about the ADA, um, and that's for you to review at some point, um, as long as your, your cancer is defined as a disability, which we know cancer is. Next slide, please. So the next one I wanted to just briefly talk about, it's very similar to ADA, is the Family Medical Leave Act, FMLA. And that's important for you to be aware of as well, because um, the difference between that and the ADA is that you have to have worked in employment for at least a year, and then that buys you um, at least 12 weeks of unpaid leave um, in the 12 month period, which is really helpful in case you do need to go for procedures and treatments and so on. And then also it does protect your benefits and your job. So that's really important that you familiarize yourself with that too. And of course, I'm not a legal expert in any of this, but if you do need more information, you can certainly speak to um, the you know, a lawyer um, and who specializes in labor laws. Next slide, please. Thank you. So this is, I thought was really helpful to just share with you today. And that's really about employee employer related disclosure. And really it's about disclosing or controlling your message that you would like to share with other people in this particular context. And I think it can lend itself pretty well to the um, personal side as well in terms of in the, you know, family and friends. But I think it's pertinent certainly for um, work. Um, so the question again is, should you tell and you're going to go through that process of um, determining, you know, like the decision to, you know, to disclose in the first place, whom should you tell, when should you tell, that's a very common uh, question that comes up, like when should I have this conversation with my employer, um, how much should you share and, you know, and, and how should you share and we talked about that well. And sometimes identifying a point person at work, like a manager who's kind of up to date on, you know, your treatment or what's going on, essentially, if things change, then you feel, feel comfortable speaking to them about that, then they can hopefully either, you know, protect that information or share it with you, you know, based on what you decide to do, what you'd like to do. Um, maintain your focus, know your limits, set boundaries. Those are just common things about controlling your message and what you would like to share with other people. Um, it's also important to remind yourself that there are, how do you treat side effects in the workplace? So even when you're thinking about returning to work after going through treatment, you know, what sort of thoughts do you, I think a little bit of thought needs to go into how do you prepare and plan to return to work. And some of the things that you might want to consider is pain management. Like how am I gonna manage my pain if I experience it during the day, if I'm at work? How am I going to this talk about or uh, uh, cope with hair loss? What am I gonna do ahead of time? And there are lots of ways to, to deal with that. Chemo brain, chemo fog, we know about that as well. That does affect your attention skills and your cognitive um, functioning memory, all of that, so it's really important. Um, fatigue is a big one. Um, that's, I mean, how you, if there's a restroom that you can rest and have a little break during the day, I mean, there's lots of things that pop up around this, certainly around fatigue. Body image issues, like, you know, some of my clients have shared with me that um, they're worried about returning to work because they've lost a tremendous amount of weight. How do they then re-enter the workforce and see their colleagues and they know, especially if they feel they don't know about their diagnosis. So there are some sort of things to sort out before um, you actually return to work. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, I basically just wanted to kind of generally recognize that most researchers acknowledge that there are positive benefits in disclosing a health diagnosis such as cancer, since we do know that talking about it does provide some support for us. It does organize our thoughts and helps process our feelings. Um, there are some studies about um, if a person chooses not to disclose and that is associated can be associated with low emotional well-being in people. 
Um, and obviously they're saying that good you know, family support, however way you define family, of course, um, is always a good way to help a person cope with the psychological effects of managing and disclosing your diagnosis to other people. So you're definitely going to have to weigh the risks and, um, and um, benefits in deciding how, where, and with whom you wish to disclose. Next slide, please. Um, right. And so the other thing you want to consider is, you know, think about your social networks and use the resources that are available to you at your disposal. You can um, identify community resources, support groups. They're very helpful. Um, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are people in the community who have been where you are or are struggling uh, where you are. Um, you know, uh, you can also consider preparing how you wish to disclose to both family, friends, and employees. And try to talk about your feelings. I know that's really tough. I know that's very hard. But, you know, try to be honest about your emotions um, if you can. And that's a process in of itself. But if you can try to do that, that's going to definitely help you in the long run uh, with your managing your anxiety and your stress. Next slide, please. And the last parting thought I'd like to leave you with is um, just to remind you essentially that disclosure is a dynamic and gradual process of communicating your health information. Um, we talked about that earlier. Um, sometimes it's helpful to rehearse and prepare for the actual disclosure event, but keeping in mind that this is like an, a fluid thing that can, can tend, tends to be um, ongoing. Um, and then perhaps what's also been suggested is create a collaborative, open and integrated approach with sharing with your employers. So, you know, like share with them how you feel that you're going to be able to manage and do your work tasks and so on and have a some sort of collaborative approach to doing that. that. That will be helpful and ease some of the anxiety for you. Understand your triggers. Again, that's around, you know, how, to, how you can interact with other people and set, you know, clear boundaries so you know that you can manage that as well and when others offer offer to help you consider accepting that help you never know it might it might serve you well okay well next slide please um i have that's the end of my talk for today um i do have some resources that i've listed and we'll be happy to um, share them with you if you would like uh, um, after the talk at some point so I just would like to um, pass this torch on to some of my colleagues next to, to talk about um, disclosure with children. Thank you. My name is Shipra Srelovitz and this is my colleague, Jessa Flowers, and we are child life specialists. Um, we work at the Stephen D. Hassenfeld Children's Center for Cancer and Blood Disorders at NYU. Um, and as child life specialists, our jobs are to um, work with children um, with cancer diagnoses um, to and uh, help facilitate healthy coping and adjustment to their diagnosis and to their treatment. Um, we work on a, a team of um, with psychology and social work and nutrition, um, education, and a lot of other psychosocial disciplines. Um, we work to support siblings throughout this process as well, so not just the patient, but um, siblings and their parents. And periodically, um, we've been called to consult with uh, the medical team, the treatment team of um, on adult units for adult patients um, to help support their children with their diagnosis as well. So uh, we're excited to be talking to you today about communicating and disclosing a cancer diagnosis to children. Um, and through uh, this presentation, we're probably going to be saying your child a lot or your children, and some of you may be grandparents or other types of caregivers, but just um, know that we were referring to all children who you may be uh, thinking about during this process. Next slide, please. Uh, and so, you know, throughout this, this process, now you're hearing this and you're, you may be, you may have been dealing with this for a while already, or this is yeah, your diagnosis is new um, and you're potentially overwhelmed already with coming to terms with your illness or your loved one's illness, um, dealing with your own big emotions and anger and confusion, grieving your loss of normalcy at this point, and now trying to wrap your head around supporting your children through this um, and, and giving them this big news. 
Um, and in having these conversations uh, with caregivers in the past, we've heard a lot of these concerns coming from them, such as, where do I start? How do I get this conversation started? What are the words that I'm supposed to use when talking to them? Uh, what if I mess this up? Can I do any damage in having this conversation? Um, how will my child respond and kind of the fear of the unknown of what that might be like when maybe you haven't had a conversation like this or this magnitude before? Um, what if I cry during this conversation? Is that a sign of weakness if I cry during this conversation? Um, and, and all of that is your, you know, as your parent and caregiver responsibility of protecting your children, you might be saying, why worry them? They'll, they'll cope better if they don't know and we keep everything normal and not disclose this information. Um, and we know protecting your child is your number one responsibility. So why do all of this? Next slide, please. Great, thank you so much, Shifra, for getting us started. Um, and thank you to all the attendees here for welcoming us into this space this evening. Um, so you'll probably notice um, right away that this slide is jam-packed with text. Um, so for all of the reasons that Shifra just described about what can make disclosure to children so difficult, um, we figured we better make a pretty strong case for communication. Um, we also share so many different reasons, um, appreciating that every family is unique, um, and we're hoping that there is something within um, this list here that your family will connect strongly with. Um, so to begin, children are highly observant of distress in their families' lives. Um, they are incredibly tuned in to uh, facial expressions, um, whispered conversations, uh, tiny changes in routine, um, heightened tension, they really absorb all of this. Um, which brings us to our, our next bullet point here. Um, I think we get faced um, oftentimes um, with parents asking like, aren't I going to cause a lot more anxiety? Aren't I going to scare my child by giving them um, scary information? Um, and we find ourselves repeating this statement, I think so often, which is that, information is not what scares children. It's noticing this distress, all of these major changes going on in their world, um, and not having an adult um, help them to make sense of what they're observing. Um, also, you want to ensure that your child hears this news from you in more of a purposeful, supportive way, um, and certainly not overhearing um, or you know, through somebody else uh, in an unintentional way. Also withholding truth can lead to a stress reaction um, that can impact functioning with peers and in school. It can cause a lot of conflict and mistrust with parents um, and really a lack of an opportunity to prepare psychologically for all of the changes that are to come um, and can model the acceptability of being dishonest. Um, so these next three reasons um, are more positive and strengths based. Um, this is really an opportunity for you to model for your children. How does our family approach um, a crisis when something really difficult occurs? Um, also, children are capable of real resiliency when they're surrounded by love, comfort and security of the caring adults in their lives. Um, and here to, to take us home, um, knowledge is not only their right, but their greatest need and their future well-being may depend on your courage and honesty right now. Um, and I think we certainly don't want to minimize this word courage um, and emphasize that certainly an approach like this um, requires a great deal of courage. Um, and being honest with your child is, is really a tremendous gift that you are offering them. Um, and so to encapsulate all of these whys, um, the ultimate goal of communication is for children and families to maintain an honest and loving bond. Next slide. Okay. Um, so we're bringing in a little extra reinforcement here from Dr. Becky Kennedy. Um, some of you may, may be familiar with Dr. Becky um, on Instagram. She is a lead psychologist. Um, she special, specializes in parenting and um, child and adolescent emotional health. And she talks a lot about hard truths um, and how to deliver a hard truth in a gentle and 
um, supportive way. Um, so the idea here is that during in-flight turbulence, which perhaps may feel very similar to facing a cancer diagnosis, um, you certainly don't want to hear the pilot overhead saying, stop screaming, there's nothing to be upset about, everything is fine, um, when in fact everything is certainly not fine. Um, what you want to hear instead is more of a sturdy statement that sounds more like, yes, we are going through turbulence, I know you're scared and that is okay, I know what I'm doing. I'm not afraid of this turbulence or your fear. Um, and the reaction here is like, whew, somebody else is acknowledging that things have gotten a little scary here. Um, nothing's changed about that situation and yet I just feel a great deal safer. Um, so similarly, when it comes to a moment of crisis and you're in families, children are looking to the adults in their worlds as confident leaders to um, step in and help them regain a sense of safety. Next slide. So hopefully by now we have convinced you that this is the way to go. Um, so breathe. And now we're going to talk about preparing yourself, getting in the mindset, okay, I'm going to have this big conversation. How do I get ready? So the first thing to remember is that you do not need to get this perfect. The, the goal here is that you are somebody that they love and trust and that love and trust them and they're having a supportive conversation with you. So if the words aren't perfect, that's okay because you're going to be having this conversation a lot. So you may want to start small and build on that. You don't want to find yourself having conversation where something big is happening and you now have to start from the beginning and work your way up to this big thing, this big event that's now happened, but starting at the beginning to say, you may have noticed this and here's what's happening and building on that. Um, it might be helpful to find regular intervals to have these updated conversations. So maybe after follow-up visits to the doctor to be able to give updates and build on what you've already started. And again, based on age, especially for the younger kids, you're going to be repeating a lot of the same information again, and maybe in different ways to make sure that the information is getting through and being processed. Throughout all of your conversations, you're really going to want to be following your children's cues. So they're going to tell you how much they want to know and when they've had enough and kids send very clear cues of when they are done listening it's enough information so you may have prepared to really go in detail and have a this very long conversation and it may end up being very short so being able to be flexible with your conversation and really observing how your children are handling the conversation is going to be key to make sure that you're not overwhelming them with information and giving them too much at once uh, and a lot of caregivers are really concerned that when we say give information and be honest, that it means, all right, give them everything and hope for the best. But honesty does not mean sharing everything all at once, as long as anything that you're saying is the truth. That is going to be a key takeaway from here is just to be very honest with any information that you are giving, no matter how little you're giving at that time. Next slide, please. So when you're having these hard conversations, a lot of family members just want a script. So what do we say? How do we say this to kids? And unfortunately, there's no one script for this kind of information because a lot of it is going to depend on age and developmental level and what you know about your child already. And we're gonna get to some of that shortly. Um, but there are some basic points that you wanna make sure to include in your conversation with your child. So you want to mention that someone in our family, whether it's you or someone or your loved one is seriously ill, you want to give the name of the disease um, and do your best to explain your understanding of what is going to happen. So the, the very brief version of this might sound something like this. Daddy has a bad sickness. The sickness is called cancer. The cells that make up his added in whatever body part is sick, are growing in an unhealthy way and hurting his body. The doctors are treating daddy with strong medicine now, 
and we have every reason to hope and believe that he will get better. So you may, at the beginning of this conversation, want to reference maybe something that your child has already seen. You may have noticed that daddy has been feeling really tired. He hasn't been playing basketball with you as much. And he went to the doctor and here's what we learned. Um, it's really important here also to make sure that you identify what part of the body is sick. Um, it helps the, your child make more sense of what's going on. And throughout this conversation, you want to make sure that you're checking for understanding. So asking a question like, can you tell me what you understood just now? Um, it's just so that they can repeat it back to you and you can make sure that they um, don't have any misconceptions that you might need to correct at that time. Um, and the key during this conversation is for children to know that they are safe, that they are loved, and that they are not at fault. No matter what emotions that they're having, those are normal, they are okay. To invite lots of questions and make space for a lot of questions, make sure that they know that anytime they have those questions, it is okay to ask those questions and that you will um, prepare them for any big changes that will be coming their way. Next slide, please. Great. Um, so as Shifra um, mentioned, the way in which you approach conversation with your child will very much depend on their developmental stage. Um, and just quickly acknowledging that we are glossing over infants and toddlers here, um, where verbal discussion won't be appropriate, um, but to acknowledge that um, at that age, maintaining safety and normalcy and routine uh, will be most supportive in helping infants and toddlers adjust. Um, so we'll walk through each stage here, um, starting with preschoolers. Um, at the preschool level, um, engaging in doctor play can be a really effective way of opening up this conversation. So it can be as simple as picking up a stuffed animal, um, having some medical supplies, whether they be um, real or um, pretend, um, and starting to walk through a story here. Um, and in that, within that story, um, as Shifra mentioned, you want to get into identifying the body part that is sick, um, perhaps how, um, you know, daddy is getting his special medicine. Um, and you'll want to refer to words that your child is already familiar with to describe illness um, and body parts, whether that be, you know, boo-boo or ouchie, um, whatever is most comfortable for them. Um, at this age, um, you know, preschoolers very much live in a stage um, where they're very egocentric. Um, there's a lot of magical thinking happen. Um, essentially, everything that goes on and occurs in the universe is sort of centered around them. So um, there are a couple of um, very common um, sort of misconceptions here that you want to be certain to address. Um, the first being um, that there's nothing that they did or didn't do that caused the sickness. So even if that's not something that they are bringing up independently, you want to be able to get at that. And it may even take a lot of repetition to remind them, you know, I don't know for sure how I got this type of sick, but what I do know is that there is nothing that you did or didn't do um, to make me get it. Um, and sometimes we, we even hear children say like, oh, you know, I thought that maybe it was because last week, like, I ate that bag of candy or I hit my sister. You might even hear some of those examples come out. So um, reassuring, offering that reassurance is, is really powerful. Um, you also want to um, get at this idea of contagion um, and really draw the distinction between cancer and other types of sick like the cold and the flu and COVID, um, you know, that kids are very um, familiar with hearing about how easy it is to catch those kinds of sicknesses um, and describe here that this is a very different type of sick. Um, you can't get this from hugging me, um, from sharing food with me. Nobody can catch this, this cancer from me. 
um, preschoolers are also very concerned with who's going to take care of me. Um, and at this age, um, routine is what really establishes a sense of safety. So you'll see here in this image, um, this is an example of a visual calendar um, that we often help families to create with their children. Um, so this would be very appropriate for um, a school, or I'm sorry, a preschool age child, um, where at this age, they can understand present and future in terms of what is happening today and what can I expect to happen tomorrow? Um, is daddy going to be at home today and at the doctor's office tomorrow? Um, does that mean that um, you know, grandma will pick me up from daycare tomorrow? Um, whatever is most relevant for their routine are the things that you'll want to build in here. Um, and it can be really helpful to include children in the process of developing a tool like this so that it feels all the more meaningful and special to them. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to school agers. Um, at this age, um, as Shifra has, has mentioned, um, a great place to start is exploring what your child already knows, um, maybe has already taken notice of or picked up on. Um, and you may be surprised to find that your child um, is actually aware of quite a bit more than maybe you um, appreciated. Um, all of those concerns that um, we mentioned in the previous slide with preschoolers are still relevant here, so you want to be sure to address all of those. Um, and, and here you'll really want to give a lot of consideration to what is your comfort level introducing terms like, like cancer and chemotherapy. Um, I'll briefly share here that our professional stance is very much in favor of introducing these real words early on. Um, giving you the opportunity to shape your child's exposure to those words. Again, um, very much wanting to prevent them from hearing those terms from somebody else in a less intentional way. Um, and you can really help to dispel um, fear and help shape your child's association um, with those words. Um, also naming a condition um, can, you know, a lot of families wonder, like, is that going to be so scary for my child to hear these words when, in fact, giving it a name can actually remove a lot of the fear and mystery um, and just become so much easier to discuss as a family as opposed to referring to, you know, a tumor, for example, as a thing that's growing, right? Like a thing can sound very scary. Um, so on the left, we have examples of different activities that school agers can start to get really engaged in um, with using, you know, loose parts and visuals to represent concepts that can otherwise be very abstract and complex. So we have blood soup happening here um, and we can see a, a healthy version of blood and compare that to what does blood look like when it's being treated for leukemia um, as well as, you know, here's how cell grow. Let's illustrate that using Play-Doh and um, talk about how tumors grow and are treated. So really getting into the visuals here. Um, and at this age, conversation about life changes can start to involve more discussion about treatment side effects um, and preparing your child for the fact that um, some days mommy will feel great and she'll be able to play like normal, um, whereas on other days her energy level is going to be much lower and she'll feel best um, cuddling with you on the couch and watching a movie. <coughs> Excuse me, next slide. Okay, so ending with adolescence and in this group, um, teenagers are the most sensitive to deception and dishonesty. Um, so more likely to lose faith in adults. Um, a lot of unpredictability here. No one ever quite knows how a teenager will respond. Um, and just to kind of take this developmental stage into consideration, um, a parent's illness um, or family member's illness can be particularly stressful um, as it prompts families to really pull together and be spending perhaps a lot more time together during a time when teenagers are otherwise, you know, wanting to spread their wings a little bit and yearning for that independence. Um, so the goal here is to be able to maintain independence 
assignments and responsibilities um, without assigning responsibilities that just aren't age appropriate, um, which can lead to parentification or, in other words, this parent-child sort of role reversal. Um, so teenagers very much want to be treated like adults. Um, we're going to get into in more depth how to address questions, um, but certainly if you don't know the answer, um, I don't know, but let's find out together um, is a perfectly valid response. Um, really important that teenagers have somebody that they trust, um, that they can connect with. Um, and don't be surprised if that person is not you. Um, it might be a friend, a coach, um, teacher, rabbi, um, some other adult in their world um, that, that they connect strongly with. Um, and knowing that with teenagers, an authentic expression of emotions can be difficult. Um, so no matter how a teenager reacts or how they appear to cope, and it may be upsetting, um, it very much may not be a reflection of, of how much they deeply care about you. Next. Um, okay, the internet. Um, basically kind of two ways to approach the internet um, when you're talking to your children, kind of two directions that you might go in. Um, some families choose to avoid asking their fam asking their children directly if they've gone online um, and kind of want to avoid planting that idea, um, in which case as a way of investigating sort of whether your child might be researching online, um, some questions you may um, me be able to ask, you know, what do you know about your dad's illness? And where did you get that information? And um, do you have any plans to get more information? And where might you get it? Um, and how can we help um, best help you to get the information that you need? So those kind of, you know, detective um, questions. Um, another approach is to kind of get at it really transparently, assume that your child is going to Google um, and engage in open conversation. Um, so that conversation might sound more like, I know that you are curious about this diagnosis. And after we're done talking, you might go upstairs and start to research this on your phone. Um, there's a lot of information out there and not all websites are reliable. So let's talk together about what you find. And also I can help to direct you to the most reliable sources. So um, certainly the what you don't want to happen is for your child and more likely your adolescent to be doing this research independently on their own and not feel like they can come back to you with what they've learned and connect around that together. Um, so two different kind of directions here. Next. So we've talked about fear of that unknown response, um, what you can expect when you're talking to your child about this diagnosis. And so there are a lot of responses that you may get. Um, almost all of them are okay. They're all very normal. Um, and here's a list of a few, just to name a few. Um, you may have your child start to cry and feel a lot of sadness. Um, and here, it's really important for them to know that you also feel sad and you sometimes also cry. It's they want you should be modeling your own emotions so that they can see that those emotions are normal and okay to feel. You want to stay away from statements like don't cry. Mommy wouldn't want you to cry. Be brave for mommy because it, it doesn't validate what they're feeling in that moment. Another response you may anticipate um, or may see is avoidance, them saying, I can't think of that right now, maybe tomorrow, I don't want to hear about that. Um, it's it's better to go too slow than too fast. And if your child is saying, mm -mm, I'm not ready to hear this now, then you can plant that seed and just say, it's okay if you don't want to hear that now. Um, but there is going to come a time when we do need to talk about this and we'll we'll try to do it on your, your time when you're ready. Um, however, if... Um, you're getting big news and a parent situation takes a sharp turn, um, then you will need to push a little bit harder and say, I know that you said you weren't ready to know, but things are more serious now and you need to be prepared. So we do need to talk about this. Um, you may have a shocking response of laughter or jokes, which is your child's um, 
way of coping with uncomfortable feelings. So that's normal as well. And what you may find is they're laughing or joking and, and maybe to you that means that they feel fine and then the sadness kind of comes out of nowhere and that's very normal as well. Um, you may find that they're acting indifferent and kind of saying like, okay, can I go back to my TV show now or can I go play video games now? Um, and what they are probably actually communicating to you is I've had enough for today. I need a break. I need space. I need to process this. I don't want to talk about this anymore. So as we talked about before, they're going to show you those cues when they are like ready to be done, hearing what you have to say in that moment. And again, you, it's important to accept um, and validate all emotions, no matter what, as they come. Um, and, you know, you may be expecting one and get the other. So be prepared to be surprised. Um, and make sure that you're checking in often to make sure um, how they're coping and check in to see what they're doing. Um, that may, their response may change over time. So check in, check in frequently. The times when you need to be concerned about their response uh, is if you're seeing major behavioral changes, um, sleeping disturbances, eating changes, um, developmental regression. So, you know, the milestones that they've hit now, you know, losing, seemingly losing those skills um, or abnormal fears. And that's when it's going to be important to go um, seek out additional support. Next slide, please. Um, and just I touched on this a little bit there, you may get a question during that conversation um, that you um, actually really don't know the answer to, or that you are just not ready to answer. You know the answer, but you are not ready to talk about that. Um, and that's okay. And that's oftentimes what caregivers are really afraid of, of not knowing what they're going to ask and not knowing how to answer that. Um, and so it's okay to say, I don't know. Um, you want to make sure that your I don't know is followed by, that's a really good question. I'm not sure. I'm going to go find the answer, or I need more time to give you that right answer but I will come back and give you that answer. So it validates that the question is important. They know that you've heard them and that you actually are taking them seriously. Next slide, please. Okay, so the last thing that we would want is for anyone hearing this talk today to be taking all this in and thinking, oh my gosh, I've been avoiding this talk. Um, you know, or maybe I've told a completely different story. I've totally messed it up. It's too late to fix it. Um, not at all. It's never too late to start doing things in a different way. And mistakes made with love can be acknowledged and corrected. Um, what's what's less important here is is getting it perfect um and knowing that um there's a lot of power and a lot of healing um in having reparative conversations with your children um so if up until now um you've sort of maybe been telling a bit of a different story about your cancer diagnosis or just avoided the topic altogether. Um, a reparative conversation might sound like I was really afraid to tell you the truth and I made a mistake. Now I know that you can handle it and I know that we can get through this together. So we empower any and all of you to, to take that out if need be. Um, and then um, just a quick word here about sort of um, the distinction between coping and understanding and kind of acknowledging the limitations of our talk tonight um, in really emphasizing the conversation piece, which is only one aspect of supporting children through a cancer diagnosis. Um, so um, I'll just briefly say that providing information, which is what we have been talking about, must always be paired with effort efforts to support coping. Um, it's never enough to simply have the conversation. Um, it needs to come along with supportive um, interventions like validating emotions, um, providing outlets for your child that help build their resiliency, um, encouraging outreach to their natural support network with peers and adults, um, perhaps um, professional support, um, and of course, above all, connections with you. Uh, and lastly, um, just to talk a little bit about some resources that might help you help your children. Um, we've included here some great books um, for you, for your children. Um, and what we always like to tell uh, caregivers about books like this, um, especially the ones that are meant for to be read with your children is a 
they are meant to be read with your children, um, not to be given to your children in lieu of speaking with your children. They're all meant to be uh, ways to start dialogue, start that conversation. And some of these books actually have some really nice language in them that help give you that script that you're probably looking for. Um, but we will always say that you should vet a book before you read it with your child, read through it, feel free to skip pages, change words slightly if you feel like you need to, but always make sure that you're comfortable with the books that you are choosing for your children. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and these are some workbooks, um, which again are meant to open that dialogue, but are a little bit more interactive than a than a classic picture book. And we have here um, a website as well that um, where you might see some of those calendars that we talked about, but kind of pre-made with reusable stickers and things um, that might be helpful to you. So um, hopefully these are all helpful for you in having these tough but important conversations uh, with your children. Um, and then there are child life specialists who work in the community, who work in private practice, who can support children as well. Um, and so that is something that, um, you know, you can you can search online to find some in your area and they might be really helpful to meet with your child in person and and help you support your child. So thank you so much. A lot of um, people that I've worked with, certainly in my clinical care with uh, cancer diagnosis, is that um, I always like to emphasize to patients that you can't control how another person might feel, but what you can do is maybe join them and, and support them and say, listen, I understand that you're also struggling with this cancer diagnosis. It's also hard for the caregivers as, as well as it's hard for the actual patient. But sometimes encouraging them just to be honest about how they feel, um, that it's tough for them, that they're really having a hard time grappling with it. Um, and then encouraging them and empowering them to actually seek their own support from some other source would be helpful because obviously you can align with them and understand and empathize how, how difficult it is for them to manage their own stress. But I think sometimes the tendency occurs when people feel that it's projected onto the person who has cancer and it's, in, it's, it's hard for them to kind of um, manage their own stress, much less someone else's. So we often suggest maybe get that caregiver or that other person, the loved one, uh, their own support, encourage them to seek their own support elsewhere, either professionally, in one's community, um, spiritually, however way they feel. But I think in, in the beginning, open dialogue, open communication, honesty about how tough this is um i would suggest you know something like that that tends to be quite helpful i think that um you always want to keep um a feeling of safety um there when it comes to questions about death and dying um, um you always want your child to feel comfortable like they can go to that place um if need be um I think um, going back to a point that Schiffer made um, and actually Dr. Lewis as well in terms of disclosure always being like a very dynamic and evolving process, um, here that becomes very important. So you never want to get to that point in a cancer journey without having all of those smaller conversations along the way. Um, and, if, and if you can approach conversations in that way where you're delivering updates and sharing honest news sort of bit by bit, um, a conversation about a change in prognosis um, or about the prognosis itself um, will just feel like sort of the natural place to have arrived together with your child. Um, in terms of sort of, you know, looking to a script, um, sometimes, you know, some language that we've um, guided parents to use before has been along the lines of um, always referring to the medicine and the doctors will never stop looking for new medicines and treatments um, that can keep the cancer under control and keep mommy feeling well and strong and doing all of the things that that she needs to do to be mommy. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, here's the information that we have, what we know, um, 
is that the, the medicine isn't working as well as we had hoped and it'll be good for us to prepare for what we might expect to happen. So that might be sort of like the language that might accompany a conversation like that. Um, but all the points that we've made along the way just really want to drive home here in terms of really tuning into your child's cues um, and their pace and what they're ready for um, and letting letting their questions drive where you go and 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 how far in terms of talking about a, a prognosis. Um, um, I think if you can find support groups for children, I think that's wonderful. Um, having an ill parent and dealing with this at home can be very isolating for children. Um, and if they can meet other children who are going through similar things, they tend to be able to talk to those kids in ways that they may not be able to speak to their friends or don't feel comfortable speaking to their friends. Um, and as we mentioned earlier um, in our presentation, it's important that kids find someone to talk to. And if they're having trouble finding that person, this may be a really nice outlet for them. So I think it would be a great idea if if they're if they're out there. Yeah. Just to jump in on that as well. Um, I agree. I think it's helpful to have a support group or allow encourage family members to go to a support group um, in the community. Um, there are some support groups for caregivers, so it depends on the role that one plays uh, in the family system might be important to discern, but I definitely think that would be helpful. So then that way that that's a space for the family members to feel that they can be honest and open about how they're feeling, how what their reactions are to their loved one's um, cancer journey and cancer experience. Um, and they can create a safe space with other people who are also in a similar boat. So yes, I would definitely strongly recommend that if they can.